Hello, everyone, and welcome to Homeland Security Today's webinar on new threats in, and trends in cyber. Uh, my name is Christina Tanaschuk. I'm the CEO of the Government Technology and Services Coalition and the executive editor of Homeland Security Today. Uh, we're thrilled to have you here with us, uh, but we're even more thrilled to have Albert Murray, who serves as the Assistant Special Agent in charge of the Washington Field Office's Cyber Division with us today. Uh, and what we really wanted to talk about are you know, the continued threats in the cyber environment. And I know that everyone is exhausted by hearing about it, <laughs> but the, the bottom line is that these threats are just increasing and the FBI is on top of those threats. They want to be able to share uh, information and resources with the private sector, but certainly also to partner with all of you to make sure that, that we are as secure as possible and that we're working as a close-knit team to mitigate, stop, and detect these attacks as soon as they're happening. So uh, welcome. Welcome to the webinar, sir. Okay. Uh, thanks, Christina. Yeah. I'm grateful to you and Homeland Security today for hosting this webinar and helping me to get the FBI's message out. I think it's very important that uh, people understand what the FBI can do and how they can help us um, address the cybersecurity concerns around the country. This afternoon, I want to focus on the need for the FBI and companies to work together against cyber threats. I've been with the FBI 17 years and I've seen what the FBI is capable of. And that's why, although I may be slightly biased, I believe the FBI is the world's premier domestic intelligence, law enforcement and investigative agency. Since its creation, the FBI has been investigating crimes and collecting intelligence to protect the American public. If your child gets kidnapped, there's no one you'd rather have on the case than the FBI. And when the bad guys commit a crime, they'd prefer to have anyone else on their tail except the FBI. Today, that's just as true in cyberspace as it, is, as it is in the brick and mortar world. Our adversaries use all the tools at their disposal to achieve their strategic objectives. And we're focused, and we're using on all the tools of the federal government to hold them accountable. The FBI is unique with authority to investigate and collect intelligence on criminal organizations, as well as hostile foreign governments. If you only look through the lens of cyber, you're missing a lot. Remember, it's not a computer attacking you, but a criminal gang, a nation state actor behind that computer attacking you. When you work with the FBI, you're leveraging decades of experience across the Bureau, such as our counterintelligence division. They are experts in combating foreign intelligence threats on US soil. They provide a unique insight into why a particular company was targeted as well as look for any in-person human targeting or insider threats trying to steal any information. And you get our cyber or our criminal division to stop massive cyber criminal schemes that can cost companies money and threaten ordinary Americans' life savings. They are experts in insider trading, complex money laundering schemes, and organized crime groups who may also use cyber to further their criminal schemes. Through our 56 field offices nationwide and presence in nearly 75 countries, we're able to track our adversaries to hold them accountable or work with partners to freeze their illicit proceeds or disrupt infrastructure used to launch their malicious attacks. Now I wanna talk a little about, about the threats. At present, China and Russia pose the greatest espionage and cyber attack threats, but we anticipate that all of our adversaries and strategic competitors will increasingly build and integrate cyber espionage, attack and influence capabilities into their efforts to influence US policies and advance their own national security interests. For instance, the Chinese government runs the most active cyber theft in ring in the world. And they are just as focused on stealing US business trade secrets, as well as US national security secrets. Essentially, the Chinese strategy for catching up to the United States economically um, and as a global power has been to lie, to cheat, and to steal at every opportunity. They have a massive, sophisticated cyber theft program conducting more cyber intrusions than all nations in the world combined. They are stealing staggering 
staggering volumes of information, including proprietary secrets, which they use to enhance their military technology or provide to their state-owned businesses so that their businesses can unfairly compete on the global stage. They employ intelligence operatives, AKA spies, as well as hackers. They're blending online and in-person in -person operations with cyber intrusions. Their goal is to dominate key technologies by undercutting businesses who compete fairly. When the Chinese are successful, that results in job losses and devastates local economies and threatens US national security at home and abroad. Now on to Russia. I know we've heard a lot about Russia recently. Russia continues to be a highly capable and effective adversary. Similar to China, they integrate cyber espionage, cyber enabled attacks, as well as influence operations to achieve their political and military objectives. Russian intelligence and security services have and will continue targeting US information systems, as well as the networks of our NATO and Five Eyes partners for technical information, military plans, and government, as well as political party policies. Russian cyber actors are also known to gain unauthorized access to sensitive or secret information from victims, stealing that information to then publicly release through proxies with no direct ties to the Russian government. These leaks are designed to sow discord and confusion among the targeted audiences while straining ties between um, allies. Finally, with Russia, we may concern that Russian cyber criminals would target US critical infrastructure, in particular, the financial services sector with ransomware attacks, either in support of the Russian government or to take advantage of an even more permissive operating environment in Russia. That's why we're focused on the whole gamut of the threat emanating from Russian intelligence services and Russian cyber criminal groups. And you should consider that potential that some criminals may be acting in support of the Russian government when determining your response. Now, Iran. Iran is bolstering their capability to wage cyber attacks against the US and our allies and is using increasingly sophisticated techniques. Iranian cyber actors are targeting US government officials, government organizations, and companies to gain intelligence and position themselves for future cyber operations. Tehran also uses social media platforms to target US and allied audiences. Iran is also using social media as a way to target individuals. Historically, they have targeted US government officials, government organizations, and companies to gain intelligence and position themselves for future cyber operations. Now, of course, hostile foreign governments aren't always looking to steal information. They can also use cyber attacks to break things, and they aren't always precise when hitting their intended targets. For example, in 2017, the Russian military used malware called NotPetya to target Ukrainian critical infrastructure. The attack was supposed to look like a criminal heist, but was actually designed to, to destroy the systems it infected. They targeted Ukraine, but ended up also hitting systems throughout Europe, plus the US and Australia, and even some systems within their own borders. That attack ended up causing more than $10 billion in damages and was global before anyone knew anything. While nation state threats concern us for their persistence, sophistication, and potential for destructive intent, over the past several years, cyber criminals using ransomware have had the most visible direct impact on US critical infrastructure. Criminals have used ransomware to target anyone they think would pay to get stolen data back. We've seen them compromise networks for oil and gas pipelines, city governments, grade schools, 911 call centers, and even our food supply. I can't think of anything they would consider off limits. The US government labels 16 industrial sectors as critical infrastructure. And basically what that means is that their assets, systems, and networks are so vital that losing them would debilitate our national security, economic security, public health, or safety. In 2021, we saw ransomware incidents against 14 of those 16 critical infrastructure sectors. In May 2021, a ransomware attack on JBS, the world's largest supplier of beef, chicken, and pork, resulted in a complete stoppage of their meat production facilities in the US, Canada, 
in Australia. And by the way, that's why my wife told me I should become vegan. That lasted until June when JBS paid an $11 million ransom, not something we advise companies to do, but JBS felt it was necessary. And bad actors love to go after things that like that, things that we can't do without. We only see the threat getting worse and worse. Now, of course, if a skilled adversary is determined to get you, they'll find a way. And that brings us to why it's so important to contact the FBI as soon as you suspect that you've been compromised or as you've been updating your cyber incident response plan. Across the Bureau, we've put capabilities in place to fight back against cyber criminals and to help victims. The FBI has cyber task forces in all 56 of our field offices across the country. Washington Field Office, I'm proud to say, has the largest cyber task force in the country. So if you call for help, you're going to get a whole team with specialized expertise to help you. At our headquarters level, our Internet Crime Complaint Center established its recovery asset team to assist with unauthorized wire transfer schemes, such as those that come from BEC scams. Just on a side note to that, reporting a, a business email compromise or any unauthorized tra tra wire transfer within 48 hours exponentially increases the likelihood of our ability to work with our partners to recover some or all of your funds. Out of the top 50 US banks by assets, the IC3 Recovery Asset Team has partnerships with 45 of those, including all of the 10, top 10 US banks. Every year, IC3 calls through thousands of public complaints to help fraud victims recover hundreds of millions of dollars of losses to cybercrime. So we can be there to help you, but we also need your help because an enormous amount of information about the cyber threat sits on the systems and servers of US corporations. And if US businesses don't report attacks and intrusions, we won't know about most of them. And that means we can't help you recover and we won't know to stop the next attack, whether that's an attack against you or attack against another US business. And the more quickly you can give us technical details about the attack, the more we can help. In particular, providing us quick access to cyber incident reports helps us link the intrusion to other FBI investigations or those of our partners in the intelligence community, homeland security, or overseas. And that helps us identify common perpetrators in virtual infrastructure. Using these insights, we provide victims technical information and support to stop ongoing incidents and to prevent additional malicious activity. FBI has a policy to notify victims, and it's very important. I really want to like talk about this a little bit. And so basically what that means, whenever we learn of a potential threat against anyone, uh, we are constantly finding ways to report that as soon as possible. Now, some of these threats are specific and detailed, and others are vague and generic. Regardless, we try to provide as much information as we can and as early as we can. Additionally, some of these threats are derived from FBI sources of information, and others are from our USIC partners or our partners around the world. While we always strive to provide notification at the lowest classification level, and we prefer it to be unclassified, it makes it much easier for us to share with you um, where we receive that information or who we receive that information kind of uh, limits us in that ability. And if, it's, uh, if you receive information that's at a higher classification than unclassified, we can work with you to provide you a one-time read-in so that you can understand the threat a little bit better. As cyber is a global threat, we have subject matter experts in various field offices who are responsible for the overall investigative strategy to mitigate various threats, such as specific nation state attacks or specific ransomware variants. As such, your local field office, in this instance, Washington field office may not be the office you, may be the office you interact with as part of the investigation. However, the, investi the investigation itself may be prosecuted out of another part of the country. In those instances, the FBI and Washington Field Office will be your, still remain your point of contact. Now, really, I wanna talk about how it all works by walking you through an actual example. 
And this example is from 2015, 2018 timeframe, and it's regarding the Sam Sam uh, ransomware incident. In December of 2015, the FBI began to track the Sam Sam ransom very, very. Between December 2015 and December 2018, Sam Sam infected more than 200 victims and caused over $30 million in losses. The ransomware targeted the healthcare sector, public transportation, police stations, and county and country and city governments nationwide, as well as private businesses around the world, particularly in the US, UK, and Canada. The, ransom on these, the ransomware on these victims reduced their ability to provide essential public services. Some of the more public infections in the United States included the Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital, the city of Atlanta, and the port of San Diego. At the start of this campaign, or the ransomware campaign, evidence and analysis showed SAMSAM was unique in several ways. First, to actors who were working behind the keyboard to manually attack victims by initially compromising networks through a known web server vulnerability, and also through an unauthorized RDP or remote desktop protocol access. Second, the attackers targeted entire networks and not single computers. Third, the attackers did not use a conventional command and control infrastructure to conduct attacks. Instead, they relied on a series of distributed virtual private servers and the Tor anonymization network. So FBI Newark opened a criminal investigation in January of 2016. And as I mentioned earlier, the FBI has 56 cyber task forces with the capability to respond on site anywhere in the country within hours. In this case, the FBI had pre-established relationships with some of the victims. And just for awareness, the FBI values strategic engage engagement with the objective of creating an open dialogue with a company or organization before an incident. These relationships build trust in advance, improving investigative response time and provides access to sensitive evidentiary data and faster attribution um, earlier on in the investigation. As victims across the country began to report their data had been encrypted, FBI Newark took the lead so that there would not be multiple investigations on the same malware variant across the country. The cyber, the cyber task forces around the country responded to victims in their local AORs and provided investigative information to FBI Newark, who led the investigative effort for the FBI. FBI Newark relied heavily on the more than 50 of the 56 cyber task forces to collect evidence and immediately respond to victims. The FBI observed that many of the victims were for specific critical infrastructure sectors that were more inclined to pay a ransom due to their impact on the public sector, the healthcare sector, public transportation, police stations, and city governments around the country. The FBI also worked with local, state, and federal agencies, including DHS, um, now it's known as CISA, on all of these incidents. So just to talk a little bit about the role between the FBI and CISA, the FBI's role um, as governed by a presidential policy directive is to provide threat response activities. That is the law enforcement and national security investigation parts of cyber incidents. This involves investigating a case, providing attribution to an attack, identifying disruption opportunities, and facilitating information sharing, among other things. CISA's role, on the other hand, is to provide asset response activities. That is providing technical assistance to impacted entities to help them recover from an incident. Therefore, and the FBI and CISA often work very closely on cyber incidents. And in fact, for the ransomware incident, at some of the victim sites, both FBI and CISA were present and involved with the victim entities. So the FBI was not only receiving information from the victims around the country, but was also getting intelligence and investigative information from foreign partners, including Canada. Due to the SAMSAM actors' use of attack infrastructure around the world and their use, overseas, their use of ultra overseas virtual currency entities, FBI Newark worked with law enforcement around the world to facilitate information sharing to help identify the infrastructure used by the SAMSAM actors. 
an, an FBI agent working in the embassy is one of our legal attaches or assistant legal att attaches worked with his overseas law enforcement counterparts to obtain computer forensic information on specific IP addresses that were used to launch attacks. And with that, I just want to again highlight that the FBI has cyber ALATs stationed in key countries across the globe. These agents are cyber enhanced who work with host countries directly. This program allows the FBI to work hand in hand with other countries and create opportunities to share best practices and training. This program also enables the FBI to impact adversaries overseas infrastructure and financial accounts, as well as arresting subjects overseas. And because of the big, large global threat, our FBI legal attaches overseas are very, very important in many of our investigations. Victims also provided the FBI information about the Bitcoin addresses where they were directed to pay. Through analysis, the FBI was able to identify Bitcoin exchangers who served as money launderers for the ransomware scheme. FBI and Newark developed relationships with multiple private sector experts as well. Several of those private sector partners were, were tracking and re regularly reporting on the SAMSAM. So the FBI worked with them to better understand the threat. These partnerships were very essential, essential to this operation. Through these investigative techniques and working with our partners, the FBI was able to determine that two Iranian nationals were responsible for the SAMSAM ransomware attack. And finally, in November of 2018, DOJ released an indictment um, highlighting the, the information, highlighting that the two Iranian nationals were responsible. And with that, I really want to talk a little bit about indictments. I know at times many people do not think that indictments result in any actual success, especially when the bad actors are overseas. However, they are a key instrument of deterrence. By making indictments public and specifically detailing the actors' identities, activities, tools, and in some cases, whereabouts, the FBI is sending a message to these actors in the world that there is a very likely chance that they will be identified, apprehended, and bought, brought to justice. And I've seen a number of investigations where these actors are caught or arrested. Um, at times, it's, it's years after they're uh, in charge by the FBI. These indictments can also limit where actors can travel. It raises the risks of cybercrime and often leads to arrests and their extraditions. FBI intelligence is also a critical piece of the puzzle for the US intelligence community when determining who is behind a cyber attack. So in conjunction with the indictment, the Department of Treasury also issued OFAC sanctions against identified two Bitcoin exchangers, marking the first time virtual currency addresses had been sanctioned. Also in many of our indictment, indictments, we coordinate with our partners around this, the world. With this particular case, the U.S. received assistance from the U.K.'s National Crime Agency, the West Yorkshire, Yorkshire Police Department, and the Canadian Calgary Police Service, as well as the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Now, I also want to talk about a little bit about what happens when a company moves quickly and reports quickly to the FBI. This is more of a recent case. In May of 2021, Colonial Pipeline, one of our lar nation's largest oil pipelines got hit by a ransomware attack from the group known as DarkSide. The attack impacted building systems and IT systems used to monitor the pipeline, but not operational systems that transported fuel. But being cautious, Colonial shut down their pipeline operations until the, they confirmed that the operational systems were safe. As they were doing that, Colonial called the FBI office in Atlanta where they already had an established relationship. Atlanta knew that the field office in San Francisco had been investigating DarkSide for more than six months already. So within hours of uh, Colonial's initial report, Colonial already had two FBI offices working their case. Both relayed relevant technical information to Colonial along with mediation tactics, techniques, and procedures. The FBI also engaged with DHS's CISA and the Department of Energy to bring their resources into the fold. The FBI ran that coordination so that Colonial could focus on their own systems. 
and our San Francisco office conducted the forensic work to help identify the intrusion vector, which was a specific compromised VPN account. That identification helped refocus the remediation work of the cybersecurity firm Mandiant, who was supporting Colonial. Ultimately, Colonial paid the ransom, got their systems back online, and reopened their pipeline after just five days. But that's not just the end of the story. In the specific case of Colonial, we were able to identify and seize the virtual currency wallet belonging to the hackers and return some of Colonial's money to them. The still is not the end of the story. Within four days of the attack, Colonial gave us specific network and host based evidence, indicators of compromise, network logs, and a malware sample. We used that information to start an investigation and publish unclassified cyber, adversary, cyber um, alerts. And we provided indicators of compromise to network defenders, sparing countless potential victims a similar fate. Now, last, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the case uh, locally here in the Washington field office. Now, while we work to provide victims intelligence to protect their networks, working closely with the victim provides us with additional evidence we can use to help protect others as well as support criminal charges. When working with victims, we work with DOJ to protect victim names, often by referring to them as victim one or victim two in legal documents. And I know a lot of victims are concerned that they'll show up um, on the news or, or the FBI report that they've been victimized. And we do not do that. We work very closely with DOJ to keep your information out of legal documents. And oftentimes what, you, what happens is when a victim sees their information in the news, and it's usually because someone from the victim side has either reported on that, or if, if DOJ is unable to um, keep the victim's name out of legal documents, we often work uh, with the victim's public affairs office ahead of time so that they're prepared before that actually happens. As investigations proceed, there are often times when the information exchange progresses to a near collaborative, uh, really real-time effort. So here at WFO, such an exchange occurred a few years ago when the FBI was investigating a form which sold user credentials and PII at a site known as Slilip. After conducting undercover purchases of stolen data associated with multiple companies, including PayPal, the FBI and PayPal actually began a healthy exchange of information. Specifically, PayPal's internal investigations team worked, worked with other victims um, and that helped the FBI identify multiple subjects as well as identify additional criminal activity. And I think most of that work could not be done without the support of PayPal in that investigation. PayPal's personnel and investigations were instrumental in the identification of one of the main co-conspirators and resulted in his arrest in 2021. So what's the lesson I really want you to get out of the examples I provided and so what I've given you so far? And that is that FBI is on your side. And if you come to the FBI quickly and share what you know about the attack, we can use our unique investigative and intelligence capabilities to help you understand and respond to the threat. With that in mind, I'll ask everyone listening to me today to do three simple things. First, if you're in the National Capital Region, you can call Washington Field Office Command and Tactical Operations Center at 202-278-2000. Again, that's 202-278-2000, and ask to speak to a cyber squad. If you're outside of the DC area, you can call your local field office. You can find the phone numbers of each of our field offices under the contact us on fbi.gov. Just know it doesn't take a massive effort to build a relationship with the FBI. Second, if you haven't already developed a formal or a formal cyber incident response plan, Develop one, and I'll full stop, foot stomp this point. When you're developing your incident response plan, include the contact information for your local FBI field office in that plan. Again, once you've completed your plan, don't just put a fancy cover on it. Exercise the plan, try it out, 
see what works, see what doesn't work. Ensure your executives are pre present or available and or active participate, participant in the exercise, particularly when you have to make uh, major decision points, such as whether or not you have to shut down your network, share information with the FBI, or, uh, or pay somebody. Ensure stakeholders know how to, to communicate um, without using the compromise system. So in a lot of investigations, we see that um, the network is compromised and there's no way for people to contact each other. So it's important as part of your um, incident response plan that you have a way to kind of contact each other out, out of band, as we call it. Third, whether or not you take those two steps, please, and the inf whenever you have an intrusion, report it to your as early as possible to your local FBI field office. The FBI can respond to your doorstep in a few hours with unique insights to help you mitigate the threat you're facing and to inform your division to, to, your decision making during an incident. Using the IT solutions company, Kasia, as another example of a company that benefited from calling us quickly after an attack, their CEO recently remarked, when we were hit, our playbook had a, as a standard process, luckily, to call the FBI the second something seemed suspicious. And we did just that. To this day, it was the single best decision that I as a CAO made and we as a company made. The FBI does cyber incident response 365 days a year, which translates to the ability to bring steady state operational capabilities to any company in crisis 365 days a year. Because cyber attacks are global, are a global issue and are border agnostic, we continue to work with our global workforce of cyber experts. Again, that involves working closely with our network of foreign law enforcement and intelligence agencies. As I mentioned earlier, we have cyber uh, ALATs um, in more than 70 embassies, or we have LEGATs or FBI agents in more than 70 embassies around the world. We have partnerships with law enforcement agencies in each of those countries. And in many of those embassies, we have cyber uh, agents that can help out as well. Finally, if your company experiences a breach, it may be brand new to you, meaning you've never seen it, but there's a good chance that the FBI has seen the hackers before, whether firsthand or through one of our partners around the world. During a crisis, we can work shoulder to shoulder with you in your incident response team. We can work in your office or, or remotely. We can work with our foreign partners to help you mitigate any attack, develop threat information, understand what happened, and inform your defensive posture. Working with the FBI, it grants your company access to our robust network of partnerships to include governments and law enforcement partners international partners and private sector entities, a network we will welcome you into. While the FBI is known for our tremendous technical, technical capability in cyber investigation, we also have other tools that may be of value. For example, if you need help managing the media, we're happy to assist with this need. If you need help safely removing a server to protect PII or other sensitive information, we're happy to provide technical assistance. If you have employees who are suffering because of an incident, we can leverage our victim services experts to support them. At the end of the day, our goal is to be the best partner we can for you. We ask that you keep this in mind. By working together, we improve our collective ability to protect against a cyber threat. So that leads to the question of what you can do to protect yourselves. I think the first and the easiest thing is to not be an easy target. Use multi-factor authentication, use complicated passwords and have active working back, backups and keep up with your patches. Just performing that little bit of cyber hygiene will provide you with a lot of protection. And finally, make sure you and your employees slow down and think before clicking unknown attachment, links or unexpected pop-ups. The majority, again, the majority of cyber attacks involve social engineering like phishing 
and rely on a human to interact with a bad link or attachment via email, text, or following a phone call. Most times, if criminals don't see an easy vulnerability, they'll move on. While all those are good things, we recognize that it could be even better if we could prevent cyber attacks from even happening. So when it comes to the US cyber strategy, playing defense is just not enough. Instead, the FBI is raising the cost for cyber bad guys, focus on disrupting three things, the actors themselves, their infrastructure that they use, and their money. And we have the most durable impact when we disrupt all three together. So with respect to the actors, we work with like-minded countries to identify who was responsible for the most damaging ransomware schemes, and we work to take them out of the game. That means arresting and extraditing them to the U.S. to face, to face justice, or it may mean even prosecution by a foreign partner. Or if they're operating in a nation that defends its bad cyber actors, it may mean issuing a warrant and posting their name to Interpol, making it difficult for them to travel and conduct business. Simultaneously, taking down cyber criminals' technical infrastructure disrupts their operations. For instance, last year, the FBI led an international operation that seized control of a botnet called Emotet. Emotet consisted of tens of thousands of infected computers, which had been used in a range of cyber crime schemes, including ransomware. With respect to money, when we seize virtual wallets and return stolen money that takes resources from the bad guys, helping to prevent further criminal, oper criminal operations. We've had even bigger successes in disrupting operations by shutting down illicit currency exchanges. For instance, last year, the Washington field office alone seized near $500 million in illicit proceeds. Again, the FBI believes in using every tool we have to impose risk and consequences and to remove bad guys from cyberspaces. And as I mentioned at the opening of my remarks, and hopefully you feel this way now, after knowing what the FBI can do and that there's no better partner than the FBI. Again, I truly believe that there is no better partner than the FBI. The FBI should be the first place that you turn to for help. Again, I really believe that the FBI is a the best domestic intelligence and law enforcement agency. And I really believe that we should be the first place you turn to for help. But we cannot do it on our own. Without close partnerships with private industry and without prompt proactive reporting of incidents, we simply do not have all the relevant information. By working together, we can protect your companies and our critical infrastructure and shut down malicious activities before they hurt anyone else. So thank you all for listening. And I'll look forward to take uh, to any questions you may have. Thank you so much for that. And we do invite you to uh, enter your questions in the Q&A box, uh, but we will get started with some of the questions that were submitted in advance. So you spoke a lot about the trends that we're seeing, uh, and you certainly address state-sponsored threat. Do you see anything specific uh, in trends affecting the energy and chemical sectors? Um, I guess with the, the energy and chemi chemical sectors, I mean, we remain concerned that they will be targeted, um, specifically because of the, uh, the war um, over in Ukraine and the U.S. support of that war. Um, but we have not really seen any specific uh, targeting at this point. Um, but we always we've had a number, a number of uh, meetings with the, uh, the energy sector and really we're pushing to them just to just be on the lookout um, for cyber attacks, but I don't have any specific uh, trends related to um, increased attacks related to that. Thank you. And what requirements do you think should be placed on the tech industry to improve security? Um, I mean, I think requirements that everybody should, you know, they should have incident response plans. It's basically as a basic requirement. The tech industry, I think, has gotten much better at um, securing, particularly things such as the IoT devices. I think initially that was one of the biggest vulnerability that a lot of IoT devices didn't really have security in mind. And I've really seen that standards related to IoT have improved where now they have, uh, everybody has their unique own password. And I think that's been very helpful and uh, 
sort of decreasing the attacks through IoT devices. Um, so um, additionally, I think I, th I think that's what I would say is, is really the biggest um, um, impact I think that would happen. Excellent. And do you see any threats or an increasing interest in data on individual U.S. voter registration information? Um, well, we I don't see any increased um, data on that. A lot of the voter reg registration data is actually you can purchase it online. And a lot of that, what we see when you see that a lot of that data um, out in the wild, a lot of that's just public information that people have either downloaded or purchased for, from other ways. So one of the concerns that I know even from my time as president of Infogrid of the National Chap Capital Region um, is certainly uh, the question of confidentiality. So some companies are concerned to call the FBI because A, they don't want their competitors to know that they're, they've are they been threatened um, or attacked or are suffering a breach. Uh, and they're concerned with the confidentiality of their data. How has the FBI addressed that? So one, uh, we keep everybody's information uh, we keep the security of that information at the highest levels. Um, we are also concerned. Um, we don't want any information to be released to the public. We hold that in very secure means. Um, it is not kept in a way um, where it can be accessed from third parties. Um, as far as confidentiality, if you're meaning like us, again, as us re uh, releasing a victim's name or information, again, we don't report any victim information and we don't confirm or deny whether or not we actually have an investigation with the victim. A lot of times, as I mentioned earlier, when you hear that a company has been victimized, majority of that time is because the victim has, has made a statement themselves. Again, there are rare instances where um, DOJ requires a victim's name to be um, in a particular legal document. And in those instances, we work ahead of time with the victim whenever possible to prepare them for that and oftentimes we put our public affairs team with theirs public affairs team so that they can be prepared for that. Excellent. I know that that is a concern. And if you saw some other folks pop on, we have we have several folks from uh, the di cyber division at the Washington field office to answer questions. So hello, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> um, let's see. The, the other question uh, I have is the the chances of getting your ransomware payment back. Um, we've seen you go after some folks and actually get some of that money back. How often does that happen? And, and do you see that happening more in the future or, or not? Um, I would, you know, to be honest, it's not often that we're able to get the ransomware payments back, but it does happen. Um, in a lot of investigations, we are able to get um, money back when we arrest people um, that allows us to seize money. And a lot of times when we seize money, we're able to return some of that, those proceeds back to the victims themselves. Um, in the future, I, I mean, I continue to see cyber criminals use as we're able to identify and uh, get information from various forms of cryptocurrency. I see the cyber criminals switching to different forms of cryptocurrency that we're able to access. So I would say in the future, I don't see any real change in our ability to get to gain access um, to criminal proceeds, specifically as um, a lot of these exchanges or ways that the cyber criminals are laundering their money are overseas and out of our jurisdiction. I don't know if Hadley or um, Kyriakos has anything they want to add to that. <laughs> You're unmuted if you guys are talking. Sorry, can you hear us now? Yep. All right, sorry about that, guys. The only thing I want to add is uh, that's correct. As we move toward virtual currencies and, uh, and the tools that they utilize to launder their money through the virtual networks, uh, we'll see a lot more faster movement toward monies uh, that move in that. The only way to combat that would be to get any and all uh, virtual wallet addresses to us as soon as possible so that maybe if 
uh, we can get that information, can work to possibly seize it uh, before it can move to another wallet. That's about it. Yeah, and I think it's really important to, to again, uh, reinforce that piece of the speed of contacting the FBI and going again to Al's point earlier of contacting the FBI before there's an incident, uh, because the sooner that you can contact us, the sooner we can kind of trace that data. Uh, we can also determine through our subject matter experts all around the country, uh, you know, depending on which ransomware variant may be occurring, a different office may have that expertise, and they might have a way of either determining if the data is parked in an area where we can get that data or in an area where maybe the money is parked, but that we can get it before the actors get to it. So really it comes back to speed of response and speed of contact to the FBI. And it is really important to practice, um, you know, the incident response plan, because when an incident does occur, um, you don't want that to be the first time when you're speaking with your uh, attorneys and your stakeholders as to who you're going to call and when you're going to call them. Sure. Excellent. Of course, that's that's the golden rule in preparedness is always be prepared ahead of time, although that's the unfun part of life is preparing, but but absolutely. Um, we've also seen uh, an increase of fraud, especially by the Russians, against individuals within companies where, you know, they pose as the boss and they say, buy me a bunch of gift certificates, and then that money is is gone. Is there anything that's being done in Congress or anywhere else to address that jurisdictional issue that, you know, it's out of the country and so they're stealing our money and there's just nothing we can do? Or is there something besides kind of that cyber hygiene and, and being aware that a dot RU address is probably not one you want to say? And money to is anything being done on that front from congress or anywhere else so i can't speak specifically to what congress is doing or working on but i will say that um as i mentioned earlier our recovery asset team over at ic3 they also work with many of our international a lot of international banks to help recover funds and again that requires the victims to report to uh to becs or that BEC information to IC3 or the local field office within 48 hours. Um, and if they do that, we've been fairly successful in getting uh, at least partial amounts of money back from for victims. And, and if I may just also add, um, while uh, subjects may be overseas, uh, we, uh, we have very aggressive and targeted investigations against subjects that are residing extraterritorially, as we may say. Um, with that, if we have a US victim, we can still hold them accountable, uh, provided that they, uh, you know, travel to a country where maybe we can work with our international partners uh, to execute an arrest. So even if the uh, subjects are overseas, that doesn't mean that we are going to stop investigating. Uh, unfortunately, many of our subjects are overseas, and we are continuing to pursue them. As Al said earlier, uh, we're working more and more with our partners over at Treasury mm -hmm. uh, to attack their uh, to attack their illicit proceeds, and then also working with our international partners to um, to attack their infrastructure that they're leveraging overseas. So more and more, we're adding more tools that we can to, again, take that fight back against the adversaries. Excellent. That's great to hear. Um, so how do you, what's your best advice on, on avoiding phishing attacks and then what to watch for? Have they evolved at all? Or what's your best advice for companies that are dealing with phishing attacks or how to keep their employees up to date? I, I would say the best advice, one the easiest thing was to be to scan all attachments before they come into your business. I mean, if you could, you would disable all links and advise people to go to websites directly. Uh, that would keep them from getting clicking on the links. And then last, I would say um, companies should uh, have like phishing um, training sessions where they attempted to attempt to fish their employees and kind of see how their employees uh, interact with phishing emails. We do that here at the FBI and DOJ does. Uh, we do a number of phishing phishing uh, um, tests here at the FBI, um, and just we you know you get uh, you can understand how various victims or va various employees interact with phishing emails, and you can provide them with additional training um, as you do that. I, don't know if I think so. Yeah, I think they are. I think we think phishing schemes are getting are evolving, uh, right? The, the days of seeing poor English uh, email, um, you know, attachments or email is, is pretty much gone, right? The, the actors are very good. They're recreating what appear to be legitimate emails. And I think, again, it's, uh, it's education, educating the workforce that if they weren't expecting the email to maybe hover over that sender email address to see where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. um, and then for any, you know, uh, we're on Teams right now, uh, or Zoom, excuse me. Um, but in this day of, you know, of, 
telework and COVID, more and more we're all doing uh, these remote team meetings. And I would recommend using one of those as a phishing test because again, you mm -hmm. want to create an opportunity where you can educate a person, not necessarily shame a person, to take that moment, to take that sip of coffee in the morning um, before they before they click and, and accept anything. I'd also like to add too that uh, using the liaison you'll have with you know the FBI and other partners, you're going to get intelligence on you know what kind of phishing campaigns are being leveraged against your particular sector, be it banking, real estate, or whatever the case may be, and then go ahead and forward that to your employees. And that level of education and constant uh, feedback and intelligence will keep them on their toes to look out for potential phishing attacks. Excellent. That's excellent advice and a great reason. Another great reason to get engaged with the FBI early. Um, do you have a single reporting number or email to use to get in contact with you? So I would say the easiest number way to get in contact with us at the at New York at WFO is to call is to call the number. I don't even have the the main number. Two two zero two two seven eight two thousand. Two zero two two seven eight two thousand. But I would say I would say that again, if someone is a, is a is a uh, victim of BEC or ransomware, they can go to ic 3gov submit that complaint. Those complaints do come to us, and they get them to us at, at relatively quickly. Uh, also, if you're a BEC uh, victim, it's really important that you put um, that financial transaction data, um, so that Al said that that our um, remote asset recovery team can work to to um, to recover those funds. Uh, really, within 48 hours, as Al said earlier, is the best opportunity for us to recover those funds. Right. But it's really important that people put that information into IC3. I would say, particularly if it's a BEC, that IC3 form, quite frankly, is um, is better than calling the 2000 number because that form is going to go to multiple entities that can assist with the asset recovery. That's right. All right, and if you have your own, if you have, a, have an established contact, you will have a direct number of an agent that you can reach out to. Right. So that would be your best bet is to have a pre-established relationship and have their contact information, email address. Excellent. Uh, have you had any specific or recent threats on the healthcare sector specifically? Um, I'm not aware of any. I don't know if Hadley or. So I, I think just, you know, just again, when we're talking about COVID, I think that there obviously has been, you know, an uptick. Um, but as it specifically relates to healthcare, I think that healthcare is one of those critical sectors that we're always seeing targeted. Right. Um, so I don't think while, you know, maybe in, in the initial days of COVID, we may have seen it, but I think that it just continues to be a target. Uh, we work very closely with our other government partners to kind of uh, get as much ahead of that threat as we can. Um, with, uh, you know, with healthcare industry, if there's theft of PII, you know, by law, that must be reported to the FBI. So oftentimes we are able to work closely with those victims. I would say with any, anybody who's out in the healthcare industry, uh, I would hope that they do, as Al said, have an established contact with the FBI to coordinate with us, um, you know, should an incident occur. And also on top of that, I mean, in any uh, sector of business, there's always going to be rise uh, of different trends. You know, one day make the rise, especially with healthcare, maybe toward identifying subjects with, that are, have access to different types of drugs, uh, be it painkillers or narcotics or whatever the case may be. As we saw with COVID, that turned into um, folks with access to um, antibiotics or whatever the case may be. So I think it, again, accents a relationship with your law enforcement partner, with the FBI, so that you can have those conversations as different landscapes change to then say, okay, I need to look for this particular trend to protect myself, be it healthcare or whatever the case may be. Yeah, like, like you said, you know, being a member of InfraGuard, you're gonna get those targeted, um, you know, uh, joint cybersecurity advisories that we that we publish, you know, with our partners over at CISA. Right. Absolutely. And I think this is a great final question. Um, unless you have more, please do enter questions in the Q&A box. But um, as far as getting in touch with you all early and getting some planning assistance, um, do you help companies with all of the different cyber frameworks? And do you do you prefer one NIST over one of the others? Uh, what do you recommend companies to to use in their systems? Uh, yeah. Sure. I mean, as far as the frameworks go, there's no um, one framework that's better than another outside of, of course, NIST is the general uh, standard, especially when it comes to protection and prevention. Uh, but however, every business model is going to use the one that works for them, critical infrastructure, especially 
um, will adopt different levels of the infrastructure, um, I'm sorry, the standards so that they can protect whatever they're doing, energy, water, and oil. Uh, NIST, of course, is a standard, but whatever one works for that particular sector is the one that is always the best. I think I think more importantly, it's important for the for the different entities to take a look at what are those crown jewels that they're seeking to protect, right? And then what's the best means to protect those with um, obviously limiting what adverse impact there may be on their normal business practices. So that's again, I think going to have this point of where you may use different standards that may be appropriate for your business. Absolutely, thank you so much. Well, I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, this has been incredibly informative. And as we said, we'll share this far and wide to continue beating that preparedness drum and certainly to continue encouraging folks to prepare early and to get to know all of you and the resources you offer all the companies in the WFO. And frankly, from this webinar, uh, they're gonna learn about things in, in their field offices all across the country. So we, we really appreciate what you do. Um, and we certainly stand behind the FBI. Uh, we know how hard you all work and we know how many resources that you have and we're happy to help get the word out. Um, we hope to see you all at Cyber 2020 on October 3rd in Fairfax, where we'll get into all of these challenges in, in more depth when we look at the uh, executive uh, executive order from the president on strengthening the nation's cybersecurity. So I hope to see all of you there, um, all of our speakers there again, because we have put the invitation out so that we offer tangible information in addition to some of the heady discussions around how to really secure the nation's digital assets. Uh, but Mr. Murray, thank you very much for joining us. And um, Vasiliakos, did Kariakos, I, yeah, right? yeah, okay. yeah. Kariakos, <laughs> I have yeah. a heck of a last name too, so um, I appreciate it. And I'm sorry I don't know your name because you're you're under I'll call one Kyriakos and the other one Vasiliakos. Thank you both very much for joining us to help with the QA. And again, thank you for your service. Uh, we stand behind you and and we appreciate everything you do to protect the American people. Thank you. Thank you.